Lucy, thank you very much for being here. When we talk about democracy, what kind of infrastructure does it require? So the basic infrastructure of democracy is the rule of law. But in the digital age, it's also the rule of code. So what we need for democracy to work are digital systems that the people can trust and that the people can see into. Democracy depends on the ability to scrutinize power. And right now, our digital systems, the broadband, the Wi-Fi, the cellular, and the apps and the search and all of that, it's owned and monitored by governments and businesses, but individual people can't see into that. So while the businesses and the government can see into our digital lives, we need to be able to see in as well and see what's being done with our information. Digital democracy, what does it mean? Well, we're living it. We're basically inventing it as we go because in all of our lives, we've adapted to using cell phones and apps and search and all those things. And, and so digital democracy means we need the, the voting systems and the participa uh, participation rates, uh, our electoral processes, they're all going to be dependent on digital systems. And so those digital systems need to be built with a more democratic set of values. And that includes transparency, includes this kinds of visibility, and it basically includes an ability, just as in uh, analog democracy, it's about representing people and being able to scrutinize power. That's what we need to be able to do with the digital systems that we now build our democratic practices on top of. So technology and all you have said are improving democracy worldwide, or those things are actually reshaping the concept of democracy? I think it's more reshaping. And we have to recognize that while digital technologies are somewhat agnostic, they can be used for good or for bad. So just as it makes it easier, for example, digital technologies makes it much easier for people to reach each other, to share information. It also makes it easier for there to be a central power that can shut that all down, that can turn it all off, that can censor it. And so we've heard a lot in the last decade about the democratizing power of digital. And that is something we can aspire to. But we have to be deliberate about that. It's not just going to work that way. We've already seen around the world, not just events like when an auto autocratic government shuts off the internet, but situations where populations that are using cell phones to organize actually make themselves easier to surveil by the police. So it's a constant back and forth, and we the people need to be understand better how the digital works so that we can use it for democracy. And does it uh, work also, uh, also to, to show that media is not monopolizing anymore? Right. Because you, you can get access to different kind of news and independent news as well. Well, yes and. <laughs> Because again, uh, particularly in the US where I come from, there's now the, uh, in the old days, if there were a few newspapers and a few television stations that really were the gatekeepers to the media, Now we have new gatekeepers. We have search companies and social media companies that are so powerful, we've just shifted gatekeepers from one to the other. So it's sort of a cat and mouse game to stay ahead of it. And it needs both action by the people, but it also is a regulatory issue and a business issue on how we're going to make sure that the internet uh, and digital communications actually stays open for democracy. The more we let it shut down, the less democratic it becomes. But the advent of digital democracy, is a cultural process or is it working more as a tool? I think there's definitely a cultural process involved. Uh, for a long time now, um, the adoption rate for digital technologies has been driven by companies that make the devices really easy to use and very addictive to play with, or the apps or whatever it is. And that's all fine, but the, those of us who are carrying these devices around on our bodies and, and using them for all of our communication, all of our writing, all of our news gathering, we need a better understanding of how they work and what, what the magic is behind them. There's kind of a, a digital literacy that, or a digital fluency that's needed so we can make better decisions about whether we want to use them for certain purposes or not. I think the use of it is, a, is, too, is too shy in Brazil. Uh, does, the, does the digital democracy pose a threat yeah. to the modus operandi of traditional politics? What the government 
win or lose yeah. when we exercise that. That's right. So, you know, over years, over decades, uh, we build up power. Power concentrates in certain places. And those people and institutions that have built up that power, they very rarely give it up quietly and go off into the night. And democracies depend on that peaceful transition of power. And what digital is doing is making it harder to exercise power in secret or behind closed doors. It's not making it impossible, but it's making it harder. But we need to keep that kind of, uh, keep using the tools for that purpose, and that will keep getting pushback then from the powers that have already established themselves. So like I say, it's, gonna, it's not gonna be a straight line to better, it's going to be a lot of back and forth. And how the political scenery can take advantage of it? Yeah, I mean, in incredible ways. We've seen in the US, for example, where elections cost a lot of money. Some candidates spend, put a lot of effort into reaching out to people who can make small contributions, small financial contributions. The value of that in a democracy is that one person equals one vote. And the more people you can get to contribute money, the more people who are actually likely to vote for you. What happens is in our system in the old days and still currently, big money plays a big role. But big money is still linked to a few votes. So there's an incredible opportunity to raise a lot of money, raise a lot of awareness, one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of people. And that's ultimately what democracy depends on, is that participation, that action by individuals. So candidates can do that better. They, they can reach out to people um, more deliberately in ways that fit those people's interests better. And people can use it to communicate back. It's, that's the other thing about digital that I think politics is catching up to, is that it's not about broadcast. It's a two-way conversation. And so just as they need people who can manage it, they need people who will listen to it as well. How is Brazil in this sense, which, is, which has a young democracy? Brazil is, uh, I mean, there have been enormous steps forward in the Brazilian democracy about some of the core values that underlie um, digital. Openness, decentralized, those are core strengths. And I think Brazil, as it pushes its transparency laws, uh, you'll get innovation and citizen actors that can come in and, and actually keep the governing agencies accountable to those opportunities. There's a reason that that kind of transparency is so important, is for citizens to be informed and engaged and to prevent that kind of secrecy. But just having a law is not enough. You don't need to actually use the tools that are now pretty widely available. They're much less expensive than they've ever been before. And they can be built by people without a lot of money to really make that kind of shine that light on the, on the process. Because uh, let's talk about the impeachment. Some say it was a parliamentary coup. Others say it uh, followed the constitution and all the legal proceeding. In this case, is democracy at stake or the problem is within our political system? Yeah, I'm not enough of an expert on the Brazilian system to answer that question. But I can say that both what's going on in the US right now and what's going on in Brazil right now is on an individual level very painful. It's, there's a lot of um, uh, anger, there's a lot of uh, partisanship. In some ways and in some views of democracy, that's actually a good thing, right? It gets people engaged, people have opinions. Um, it is important that the rule of law is followed. The, I mean, de democracies depend on laws, not men. Um, and I can't speak to the details in this case. So while it's very painful to go through and it feels like the end of the world. <laughs> um, in the broader sense, it may be critical for democracy to strengthen itself. Well, Brazil needs some reforms, such as in the areas of pensions and labor. But above all, a political reform and perhaps an electoral one as well. Do you think that digital democracy is a necessary step towards this goal or to achieve it? I don't think that digital per se is going to be the answer to an electoral problem. The, an election system depends much more on the rule of law and um, uh, credible, um, non-corrupt implementation of that law than it does on digital. In fact, one of the things we have to be aware of, back to the earlier point, is while 
digital tools might make it easier for people to vote and participate, it might also make it easier for those systems to be hacked. And so as we're trying to get people to adopt digital systems, we also have to remember that the prevention for keeping those systems trustworthy are not necessarily going to be digital. They're going to be the structural rules around the electoral system. That's the core of it. I don't think it's a digital fix. Okay, so digital is more for participation. It's a good tool for participation. And again, both the people who are trying to use it and the people who are using it need to understand it better. You need to have a paper, you need to have proof. If you vote digitally, you want to have proof that you voted and who you voted for and that it was counted. And we have not built those systems yet, not in my country, and I doubt you've built them here. So that's even more vulnerable than an old way of voting. And what are the main challenges that need to be talked for digital democracy to succeed? I think at the very basis, it's as much about digital literacy, then it's about access, and then it's about the rule of law. So we are going to move into an age when almost all of our interactions, whether it's in our jobs, it's in our family life, it's in our civic life, in our political life, there's going to be a digital underpinning to how we do that. It's already the case. All of our communications, our writing, it's all been digitized. So understanding where there are points of vulnerability becomes everybody's responsibility. I do think that elected officials and government agencies that are committed to participation can use these tools to help accomplish that. They can certainly use them to make information more widely available, and they, but they also have to be willing to use them to shine the spotlight back on the practices of the government agencies themselves. They have to be tools for visibility as much as tools for sharing. Well, democracy is winning around the world, so we, we are living a transition. Well, democracy is winning at the same time that in 109 countries around the world, the space for civil society is actually closing down. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that democracy is winning, but democracy depends on people participating and people feeling that they can make their own decisions, that they can exercise their own beliefs and their power in ways that aren't limited by the governance system. If we shut down civil society around the world, we will shut down democracy as well. So, so civil society is a key scaffold to the political system. And if that, so it's hard to, it's hard to say without reservation that democracy is winning. <laughs> um Brasil conversou com Lucy Bernholz, pesquisadora sênior do Centro de Filantropia e Sociedade Civil da Universidade de Stanford. Lucy, thank you very much. Obrigado.